Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly king, but children of the heavenly king, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, or walk the golden streets, or walk the golden streets, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. To fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. Yes, what are we doing? We are marching to heavenly Zion. So while the world is floating down the boat, in the boat of sinful pleasures, and they float down, and everything's happy, everything's okay, until they come to the falls, and then they go over the falls, and they drown in their pleasure cruise. God's people are marching. And they're marching to heavenly Zion. And they get blisters on their feet while they march. They get tired while they march. They get thirsty when they march. They get hungry when they march. They get tired when they march. They sometimes feel like giving up as they march. But they keep marching. They are not floating downstream. They are marching. They know where they're going. If you don't know who you are or where you're going, you can know who you are and you can know where you're going. You just need to get in God's word and you need to be in prayer. And Father in heaven will show you who you are and where you are going. And if you're going in the wrong direction and if you are on that boat enjoying sin's pleasures, I warn you, get off that boat. Start swimming upstream and come and march with us. Let us march. Let us brave a few hardships. Let us brave a few scornful remarks. Let us live differently. Let us dress differently than the world. Let us eat differently than the world. Let us listen to different music than the world. Let us be different. Different for Jesus. The Bible says, Ye are a chosen generation. 
Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light into his marvelous light there was a roman he was a worshiper of rome's gods and he was observing the christians and he was writing about the early christians and he was describing them he did not understand them and nor did he agree with them he said this is a very strange people they do not engage in competitive sports of the day. And of course they wouldn't because a lot of them would do the sports nude, so they wouldn't be involved in that. And they don't come to the public baths. Of course, the public baths, they were in the nude. And they don't do these things. And they can, they can be persecuted and told to denounce their God and they're willing to die. They're willing to be stripped of their freedoms and their possessions in order that they may serve this God that they do not see. And he was kind of mocking these early Christians. But he did describe them very well. He said they don't dress the way that we dress. They dress plainly like peasants, like poor people. They, they don't wear the fancy, extravagant clothes that we wear. The early Christians were different. They were markedly different. In Cuba, there was two groups that were very severely targeted and persecuted in the days of communism. Two groups. The Holiness Pentecostals, because the women were, were dressed very modestly, and the Seventh-day Adventist women. And so people were known as a Christian by the way they dressed. And they were singled out and discriminated and persecuted. But today, so many of the churches have let this standard down of modesty. And they don't preach it, they don't teach it, they don't believe it, they don't live it. And the Christian and the worldly person go down the street. And the Christian cannot be identified by his clothing, because he dresses in the mainstream world. You cannot distinguish him. In the time of John the Baptist, he wore very simple clothes. It wasn't fancy. It wasn't showy. His diet was different than the general population. The way his clothing was different than the general population. Because he was different, and he was courageous, and he was not afraid to dare to be different, then people would come for miles and hike to hear this message of this prophet who was not afraid to dress differently, to eat differently, to be different than the world. If Christians were unafraid and unashamed to be different, their message would be powerful. It's kind of like the Navy SEALs. You know, the, they, the Navy SEALs, they put the standard up so high that it is a coveted position to qualify to be a Navy SEAL. It is not so much a coveted position to be in the Army because the standard is not so high. Does the Word of God have standards in it? Yes, it does. And when we see these standards and we embrace them and we live them, and we are different than the world, then there comes to be a challenge. A challenge. And when we as Christians take this challenge to embrace these standards, then the world sees, oh, they're not afraid to be different. They have something there. And there's a power in the message. But when the churches put the standard down, and they say, oh, it was all paid at the cross. All you have to have it for salvation is, is just believe. The Bible says faith without works is dead. If your love for the Savior does not change 
The music you listen to, the clothes you wear, the food you eat, the way you live your life, the movies you watch, if those things don't change, then do you really love the Savior? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you really love him, are you willing to listen to him? Are you willing to cut things out of your life? Are you willing to make some changes? Whatsoever things are pure, the Bible says. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Philippians 4 verse 8. Think on these things. If we would apply that to the movies we watch, we would watch almost zero movies. If we would apply that to the music that we listen to, then half of the music that is on YouTube, we would not give an ear to. If we would apply that to the pictures that we put into our mind, then uh, half or more of those pictures, we would not set our eyes on them. Mm. Yes, if we really believed what God said in his book, it would change our lifestyle, the way that we live. For some, following Jesus is just an intellectual belief. It's just a theology. For others, their love for Jesus leads them to a changed, a peculiar, a different lifestyle. If your lifestyle doesn't change, then are you really following the Lamb of God? Who has another song? Do you want to sing the whatsoever things are pure? Oh yes, that's a good one. Philippians chapter 4, 8, and it's King James Version. It won't work in your version. So repetition deepens impression. So I will read this first, and then we will sing it together. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. We will start singing with the word whatsoever. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4 verse 8. Hmm. Eight things in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, for those of you who like numbers. And how many fruits of the Spirit are there? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians. I don't remember the reference. Well, let's go to Galatians and count them. Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness, temperance. Okay, nine. Nine fruits of the Spirit. Are the fruits of the Spirit, are they seen in your life? 
When people walk down the orchard of your life, do they see these fruits hanging from the branches of your life? Or do they see the works of the flesh in the orchard of your life? Oh, verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, or sexual immorality, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings. Do they see these 17 works of the flesh as they pass by the orchard of your life? Hmm. Maybe they see some of the fruits of the Spirit in the orchard of your life, but they also see some of these other works of the flesh in the orchard of your life. My friends, it's time to pick up all those rotten apples that are in your orchard. It's time to pick them up and put them in the compost pile and bury them where they will be out of sight and out of mind and where the earthworms will eat them. It is time to clean out the orchard so that only the fruits of the Spirit are on the branches of your life. Because people will notice, oh, that's a beautiful orchard beautiful fruit. Or they will see, oh, that orchard is neglected. There's broken branches. There's rotten fruit. How sad that that orchard has become so neglected and there's all that rotten fruit hanging on those limbs. You may say, oh, don't judge me. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everybody who says, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, is a Christian. It is the fruit in the orchard of your life that is evidence that you are a Christian, a follower of Christ. In communist countries, they would arrest you for being a Christian. So, if they were arresting Christians for being Christian in America, would there be enough evidence in your life that you are a Christian? Would there be enough evidence that they could convict you and put you in jail for being a Christian? Or do you wear the world's clothes, eat the world's foods, live the world's lifestyle to such extent that they would never even know you're a Christian? They may never even suspect that you're a Christian. Because you look so much and act so much like the general decadent population. Mm. Wow. We have all put wrong pictures into our mind. We have all listened to music that we know that Jesus would not approve of. We have all worn things that our Father would not approve of, that would not fall under the category of modesty. We've all done that. We've all failed. And if we've failed on this point, don't. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for courage and strength. So instead of being filled full of shame, and instead of going into depression, as you think back of all the wrong that you've done, why not just ask Jesus to help you make some changes? He will forgive you of your past and He will give you strength to make the changes that you need to make. Who has a song that we can sing to close this? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after Thy will, while 
I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, whiter than snow, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, wounded and weary. Help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Wow. It says... Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. Can you have anything whiter than snow? Is there anything more white than snow? Not that I know of. Snow is so white. So no matter what your past is, no matter how dirty your past is, it may be red, it, it may be black, it may be brown, however dirty, however stinky the sin of your past. When you come to Jesus, when you come to Yeshua, He washes it whiter than snow. The only thing whiter than snow is someone who has come to Yeshua, to Jesus. <laughs> That's the only thing whiter than snow. His, the result of His forgiveness is this cleanness. Father, we're so grateful for what You've been teaching us tonight through the songs, through Your Word. Thank You that we can come to You dirty and walk away clean. We can come to You discouraged and walk away encouraged. We can come to you sick and walk away healthy. Thank you, Father. Please work in our lives and make us all that you want us to be. And we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen.